In a time of suffering, has anyone ever said these words to you? I know how you feel. Or I can imagine how you must feel. Or some other variation of this sentiment. Now, maybe you're the person who said it themselves to somebody that you were talking to or a friend that you felt was in the midst of suffering. But the truth is that often when this is said, it isn't really true. Someone has shared a deep trauma or a suffering with you, and unless you've actually experienced it or are currently experiencing it, you can't really relate. You can try, but, it isn't, but if it isn't true, it comes off as superficial And both people know it. And if you've lived in a situation like this, you know it to be true. Well, peer support groups are based off of this truth. Someone who is your peer in the same kind of suffering can be a uniquely safe place to share your feelings and frustrations and thoughts because they actually do know how you feel or understand what you're going through. How do they know? Well, they have or currently are living with the same sort of suffering. Alcoholics Anonymous is one such peer group. And before you stand up and speak to share your thoughts and your frustrations in this group, you identify as one of those gathered. Hi, I'm Jim. I am an alcoholic. Hi, I'm Jill. I am an alcoholic. And what this does is it creates a relationship of empathy and love because the people who hear that know how you feel, and understand what you're going through in a way that others do not. Well, as we enter into the season of Lent, today is our first Sunday of Lent, we can sometimes have this thought about our God as we are mindful of our sin. But the season of Lent, more than just being mindful of your own sinful state, is really learning the story about how our Lord has voluntarily become a peer along with us in all of our sufferings. You see, in our gospel reading today, Jesus is baptized by John. And John's baptism is a baptism for repentance, which leads us to ask the question, what does Jesus need to repent of? He's the perfect Son of God, right? As I shared in the children's message, right after this, he gets driven into the wilderness and he resists successfully all the temptations of the devil. So why does he get baptized? He does this because ever since he became a man, born under the law, the goal of Jesus has been to be one of us. Now, a perfect one, of course, but us, in order that He can take on our sufferings and put them to death along with His atoning sacrifice. And He's doing that by becoming human in every way, and this includes being tempted, as we see in our gospel reading today, but it also includes, as we near Jerusalem and the cross, becoming sin for us. In Mark chapter 1, Jesus begins this journey, and He begins it in earnest, Right after he's baptized, he doesn't wander out into the wilderness. He's not enticed into the wilderness. The Scripture says the Holy Spirit drove him there, for that is why he had come, to be our champion in the fight against sin, death, and the devil, to do the very thing that we could not through the strange and alien work of becoming us and in return giving us himself. And in the wilderness, he's tempted by Satan for 40 days. This is the beginning of his public ministry in the book of Mark. Because once he returns from the wilderness, he begins to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now, the season of Lent is often thought of and can certainly be thought of as a journey in the wilderness. The tunes and tempos of joyous and happy songs are not heard for a while. We don't sing or say the word Alleluia for a reason. And the readings and the sermons are instead focused on the humble state of sin that made it necessary for God to become man and die in our place. And it can easily lead us to think, well, we're just a depressing group of people, just always talking about our own sin and never experiencing the joys of the Christian life. But I think that that 
is the wrong way to view the season of Lent. The failures of the flesh come front and center to the life of the Christian during the season. That's certainly true. And looking from the outside in, one might conclude that we've all given in to despair. And that we're just sort of doing some weird form of self-punishment during the season of Lent. But the gospel doesn't leave us during Lent. Instead, it is the journey and the preparation for the gospel to take center stage. The healing, restoration, and redemption of God's people is underway. But this healing mission and ministry of Jesus first exposes the brokenness that prompted His rescue mission in the first place. So let me be the first to start our journey in Lent today with you. Hi, I'm Adam, and I'm a sinner. Look around the room. This is a safe place because everyone here is the same. We are all sinners. We are gathering in our brokenness, seeking to be mended, to be mended by a God who loves us. Our hearts are broken, our bodies are broken, and failing our spirit is broken. This is what we confessed when we confessed our sin. Because we are broken, we no longer say, do, or think the things that we should. However, we're not the only ones gathered here this morning. God Himself has promised to be among us. When two or three are gathered in His name, there He is among them. And then we start to ask the question, how can He relate to us? Because the presence of God, just that reality on its own, is really not all that comforting, especially if we're a gathering of broken people needing to be mended. It can be very easy and often is the view of many people gathered in the presence of God that He stands over them in righteous, wrathful judgment for the sin that they have confessed. After all, He isn't broken and sinful the way we are. So how can He have empathy for our condition? How can He understand how we feel? How can we know what we're going through? Well, the Word of God tells us that His love drove Him to come among us, and not as a distant and wrathful judge, but as a loving Father and His Son. He sent Jesus to become one of us, and that begins in earnest today in Mark chapter 1. Not only is Jesus baptized like a sinner in need of repentance, but He then is driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted by Satan. Jesus didn't have to do any of those things, for indeed you are correct in thinking that He has nothing to repent of, nor does He have any worry about temptation, but He has put Himself in such a situation for you. Now Jesus is human. He receives a baptism meant for sinners. Now He is enduring the same temptations that you and I endure. Yet one last barrier of doubt remains. As I shared with the children, he perfectly resists all of those temptations, so still he is not like us. How can he understand what we're going through? Well, during Lent, we follow him as he moves to break down this last barrier of doubt in Jerusalem. As Peter writes in his first letter, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By His wounds you have been healed. Now He is here in the room with you, saying to you, Hi, I am Jesus, and I am the sinner. Your Savior and Lord Jesus knows how you feel, and He understands what you're going through more than anyone else can. He took your very sins and suffering into His own body and bore the ultimate penalty for them in your place. He is no stranger to the sufferings you endure, and when you speak to Him of them, He understands what you're going through. This is the comfort we can have in the midst of our suffering. This is why we ponder our suffering in Lent, because in Christ's mercy, He joined Himself to our sufferings as sinners. So that, we, that, so that now when we suffer, we are not alone. It is part of what points us 
to the uniting of Christ within us in our baptism. It is why Christians can do the weird sort of thing of having joy in the midst of their suffering because they know Christ likewise suffered with them. And then our baptism points us to this, connect, this connection we have in suffering for the sake of the truth of God. It is how we can endure in faith and not lose hope, for we now live in the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, dear friends in Christ, as we enter into Lent, and as you are mindful of your own sinful state, as you're in the midst of the suffering of the consequences of those sin day in and day out, know that you're not alone. Know that this place here is safe for you and full of people and full of a God who knows how you feel, who really understands what you're going through. So take heart. Jesus subjected himself to a baptism of repentance to give us a new baptism, a baptism where we're not just joined to the suffering and death of sin in Jesus, but now to a new and unbroken life, a life unconquerable by death, a life that will be free of suffering in eternity when he returns. As we enter into Lent, that is on the horizon, that is what we look to the future and certain hope we have in Jesus, a Lord who loves us so much that He became sin for us so that we might have the perfect righteousness of the Son of God. A life has been given to you. It has been given to you in your baptism so that in the midst of this gathering of broken people in search of being mended, in search of healing, you hear the words of the gospel. For in this place, whenever you come confessing your brokenness and sin, you receive the same word of absolution from God week in and week out because He really knows how you feel and He understands what you're going through and He has overcome it. In the name of Jesus, amen.